Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Coffee and Football right here on On Texas Football. I'm your host, Blake Monroe, where I'm joined each and every morning by Bobby Burton and C.J. Vogel. And guys, it wasn't the outcome that we had hoped for, but it was a great game. Nonetheless, a great season, nonetheless. Y'all's thoughts? I I agree with you. I mean, personally, I mean, I, th I think that it was a great season and a great game in so many ways. It wasn't the perfect game that Texas fans wanted. Uh, but Texas didn't doesn't have to hide tail after this one. Uh, that's for sure. And, uh, you know, more and as much as anything, it, that, that's nice. Props to you, Dub. I, I think that Michael Penix played his you-know-what off uh, yesterday. Yesterday, And I think that's uh, very, very strong. A lot of comparisons to Texas Tech in 2008, which I think are, are somewhat fair. Uh, but, uh, look, uh, Texas had a wonderful season. I mean, I I, I, uh, I – was thinking back last night after we got off the post game show, Blake and uh, uh, CJ, uh, just how much uh, uh, the Longhorn fans embraced this team. I haven't seen Texas fans embrace a team like this in so so long, um, and they they put up a fight to the very end. They weren't perfect. Steve Sarkeesian wasn't perfect. He'll be the first to tell you Quinn Ewers wasn't. You know, a couple of fumbles. Uh, the defense didn't get things done the way they wanted to, even though it had a great season. Um, but uh, it made a lot of people – this group made a lot of people in orange uh, feel proud to wear burn orange again. Uh, and I think that that's a, a big that, – that says as much or more than anything I can say individually about this game right away. I think that's more important than picking apart the game line by line. That, that greater feeling that you were part of something bigger – uh, this year was just absolutely phenomenal and something these guys really, uh, really took to heart. And I think the fan base uh, followed suit. And I, I think that's the that's one of the great things about sports, that it can bring people together like this. CJ, you were at the game. Uh, give us a little take on, on what you think you saw last night and uh, some things behind the scenes there. Yeah, it was a game where Texas just didn't capitalize on moments that could have changed the outcome of the game. Yep. It, there were too many of them, whether it be big plays that they didn't convert, big plays that they allowed, uh, fumbles, turnovers, penalties. It, it was uncharacteristic in the sense that there wasn't a big moment for Texas that really changed the outcome of the game. There were too many that kind of just, uh, you know, just stumbled uh, the Longhorns in their own path. Yep. They and couldn't get out of their own way. They couldn't get out of their own way. Yep. Uh, and, I, I would add this, CJ. You had four chances inside the 15 to win the game. Absolutely. I mean, and they couldn't take advantage of it. Yeah. I mean, this is good. It hurts, but still hook them. I agree. That that, that lack of ability to uh, really make the game defining plays um, were, were there. Of course, they also had some guys step up. I mean, Jordan Whittington's catch uh, in that fourth quarter was just absolutely outstanding. Great throw from Quinn. Uh, the fact that Texas even had an opportunity to be down there in the first place uh, was uh, crazy. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, it was a series of, event, of events that I just don't think that I could have ever foreseen. I mean, uh, why Kellen DeBoer, who is clearly a great coach and an offensive mastermind, was running the ball and not just kneeling it, I'll never understand until I'm, you know, you know, it's just one of those things, guys. Uh, but, uh, you know, Longhorns, just an absolutely terrific season uh, for them. We'll talk more about the game today. we got Bob Shipley coming on at 8.30. Uh, excited to talk to Bob. I know he was uh, going back and forth on the game last night, just like all of us, uh, so that'll be fun as well. I do want to say there's a, a, a news note. Uh, Texas has offered uh, the uh, open linebackers position, is my understanding, to Johnny Nansen. It's no longer just he's a leading candidate, uh, but that that uh, has uh, he has been offered that job, is my understanding now, so we can report that uh, he is he was at least as of yesterday i believe in hawaii uh, where his uh, wife is at uh, it, where his wife is from uh, originally he's nansen himself is originally from american samoa actually and he's a longtime friend of steve sarkeesian uh, coach with him back at washington among other places uh, but he is yes he's been the guy that they've zeroed in on uh, at the linebacker role the issue or the hang up at this time is that uh, frankly nansen is the defensive coordinator and calls plays at Arizona. They're not going to bring Nansen in to call plays at Texas, I don't think, at this point in time, even though uh, Washington just sliced and diced Texas up for 500-plus yards. Uh, 
I, I, I think this is a, a situation where we'll have to wait and see exactly how they uh, push position that could be as a role of assistant head coach, Nansen, Sark, and Jeff Banks, all the best of friends. Uh, so there's a lot of ties there as well. The Under Armour All-American game comes up on Wednesday. Uh, CJ, you were down there. Six of the seven signees for Texas are expected to play as well. Uh, those, The one that isn't is uh, Colin Simmons, who's uh, nursing a ankle injury that he re-aggravated, I guess, uh, in um, uh, in uh, the state championship game. CJ, I, I want to go back to the, to the game itself last night uh, and ask you a couple more questions. Um, what did you think of uh, a couple of pieces? I, I wrote down the run, the Texas run game and going away from what Rod Babers calls the pony package, the two running back package. That seemed to have a lot of success, and we never really saw it unveiled again uh, for any length of time. Perhaps that's because Texas, as we learned yesterday, Texas only had five offensive plays in the entire third quarter. Two of them, or one of them was a fumble. One of them was a three and out, and then one started the final drive. Uh, that was the that was the telltale quarter. Uh, but the run game for Texas was extremely explosive in the first half, and then they never really had a chance to get it going in the second half because guess what? Uh, Washington really took off, and Texas fumbled. I mean, that's that's basically it. Uh, was that where the game got away for tech for Texas, uh, in your opinion? You're, you're, you're muted, CJ. That third quarter was absolutely where things fell apart for Texas. Uh, I actually thought the defense did enough to keep Texas in the game, holding the field goals uh, in that little span where Washington was able to get down the field at times. What really could have helped there was a negative play, a turnover, anything to start a, a, a revitalization of momentum for Texas. I – Saw it at the game. I thought, you know, as the team switched sides of the field for the third and the fourth quarters, you know, obviously Washington's had it, you know, up 10 heading into the fourth quarter. Their sideline, their their team is excited. They're pumped. They're meeting in the middle of the field. And I don't want to say Texas has looked dead, but there wasn't a lot of energy. Uh, the, the, like you said, only five offensive plays, one being a turnover that, you know, resulted immediately in a touchdown for Washington. It wasn't a a, a – a feel that, you know, Texas could have come back from. Obviously, there was only a 10-point deficit. Texas had an opportunity to win at the end, but it didn't feel like there was a lot of energy and hope at the time when just watching these teams switch sides of the field. So that third quarter especially, and I'm with you, I would have loved to have seen the Pony Package again in the third the third quarter. Uh, it was causing fits all day for the Washington defense, and, I mean, it – Seemingly felt like Texas was getting, you know, six plus yards per carry. Yeah, they wanted uh, it, CJ on the ball that CJ Baxter uh, fumbled. It was the first play that Texas ran from scrimmage in the third quarter, and he, he fumbled, but it was after a six yard run. Yeah, I mean, and so they didn't really. People are going to fault Sark for him going away from the run too much, etc. But he was tied at half after a wonderful. Uh, you know, halftime, uh, really two minute drill, whatever you want to call from Quinn Ewers and Sark. I mean, that was that was something that I haven't seen Texas do. It was like execution style on, right. on that. I mean, I, I I couldn't believe Texas was tied 21 21 at half uh, after after a lot of what we saw from Ewers, et cetera. But to start that third quarter, that's when they they could have gone back to the run. And it was clear that Sark was already starting with the power run in the second half and going to C.J. Baxter, but the fumble happened. Then they have a chance to get back into it in the fourth quarter a little bit. Jaden Blue fumbles. Now, the defense, I will say this. You know, a lot of people are hard on the defense for giving up 500-plus yards. Get I get it. that You know, uh, but uh, let's add this a little bit. I mean, Jalen Ford got that team fired up in the fourth quarter. I don't know if you saw that from, the, from your angle or not, C.J., but he got them fired up and got them back going. Um, and so Texas, uh, you know, we can say what we want. They fought to the end. That's been a uh, hallmark of this Texas team all season long. Look at these stats. I would, you couldn't have told me that UW only had 25 first downs compared to 23 for Texas. Texas actually had better percentage on money downs than Washington last night. Um, 
I, I was talking to Rod last – we were talking to Rod last night in the post game, and one of the things he said is, yeah, that looked good, but the difference between them this year and last year was they hit the deep ball against Texas uh, with more frequently. And Michael Penix, the nation's leading passer, I mean, look, he deserves every accolade he gets. He was he was so money uh, uh, time and time again. Texas uh, dominating the rushing stats there, 180 to 102. But really, look at the time of possession. That is just, I mean, we talked, oh, is Washington going to go tempo? Remember that, CJ, that discussion, Blake? Yep. We talked all about that. <laughs> 36 minutes to 23. You know, that's what happens when you have two fumbles. You know, and the other team can move the ball. So uh, maybe that that extra turnover is what maybe maybe cost the, the Texas the game. But uh, to, to CJ's point, guys, they they just outplayed us a little bit. That's uh, they had better players. I mean, there were receivers. It, oh, by the way, Keelan Robinson, uh, CJ, I mentioned this uh, before you came on in the post game last night. Keelan Robinson, we knew was injured prior to the game. We knew that about it. And one of the reasons we shut up about injuries was that was that. Um, Xavier Worthy still hobbled a little bit. I know people are going to say, oh, no, he's got a lingering ankle issue, issue that just – that was re-aggravated. He's just not the same player. And you look at him, only really targeted, what, three or four times all night, uh, caught two balls for 45 yards. So uh, we'll, we'll have to see how it all goes. But uh, a lot of excuses there, but they aren't really excuses. Uh, they aren't really excuses. Yeah, I thought it was crazy that Keelan Robinson was even tasked with catching a, a kickoff return. With that big point. race. It made no sense to me. Yeah. And also, Jaden Blue was doing a pretty darn good job back there to begin the game. I yep. had no idea what that decision was, but that's why I'm here not on the field. Yep. Well, I, it happened, CJ. I mean, look, they wanted their senior guy back there. Uh, and at that point in time, I also think they didn't want to risk losing Jaden Blue. Uh, he had become a clear – he had become a clear guy for them in this uh, in this offense, uh, especially coming out of the backfield. I mean, Blue made a wonderful catch, by the way, in the fourth quarter. Yeah. Uh, that was another – we mentioned the Whittington catch. Jaden Blue made a hell of a catch, too. I thought that was an incomplete pass on first watch, and then you rewind it, and it was clear as day that he caught it. He did drop a, a deep ball, but uh, Texas still scored on that possession anyways. But, um, uh, you know, look, I, I look at it and I'm, I'm feeling I, I'm disappointed Texas lost this morning. I, I, de I definitely am. I also think I'm understanding that, you know, there's a lot to take away from this season and this team. Even last night, they fought to the end. Uh, this team did seem last night like more of the 2022 version of itself than it did the 2023 version of itself kind of stubbed itself in the foot, didn't get, didn't really execute on offense at times, uh, didn't play uh, into its uh, strengths enough uh, probably, but I'm, uh, I'm, I'm just as excited about Texas football today as I was yesterday. I gotta, I gotta be honest. Uh, and that's, that's a big deal. And Bobby, I'm going to read this comment from Joe McWaters preaches sometimes. He says, who in September would have taken 12 and two and in the college football playoff? Everybody here. Let's just enjoy the season for what it was. Awesome. It, yeah. And they didn't go out like TCU last year. Yeah. I mean, I mean, let's, let's call it, call it what it is. I mean, this team um, belonged where it was. I mean, they just lost the number two team in the country, uh, a 14 and no team now. And they lost to them on the last minute. I mean, what, what else do you want to say? Um, and I agree with this. We can't say Texas deserved to win that game. They almost stole it. It, it, it is more of what, what really happened. Um, but I'm, I'm all in uh, for where Texas is headed with this football team and this program under Steve Sarkeesian. Uh, I know Pete, uh, Pete Kwiatkowski is going to get some second guessing when a guy like Michael Penix throws dimes. I get it. And I'm not saying he was perfect. He, he should have come up with – more pressure packages, maybe, uh, to to put Penix in in the uh, in more peril. But you know, the guy the guy's a leading passer in the country for a reason. I mean, he's not, you yeah. know, he's not, he's not. You're not playing, you know, you know, you know, directional state university in the college football playoff or semifinals. Uh, so uh, look, Longhorns just need to keep going right now. They've got a big recruiting day coming up. Uh, they got to find this uh, linebackers coach, whether Johnny Nansen accepts the job 
uh, the beat goes on uh, in building the program. I really believe that. Unfortunately, the Longhorns did lose yesterday, but directionally, this program is going in the right right way, period. Yeah, I think on top of that, Bobby, if Texas was to play a game as bad as they did last night or as poorly at times that they did, and they still would have had four cracks inside the 12-yard line to go to the national championship. Sign me up. That's exactly where I want my my football program to be, and that's where we're seeing it. So I think that's very encouraging, obviously. Not the, the outcome result that you wanted to see, but if that's the outcome that and, and, and kind of steps that we're currently seeing t- Texas make, that's great stuff. And I want to get y'all's take on this. This one from Glenn Davis. Of course, the Florida State quarterback, you know, he had he grew a lot of fire yesterday for some of the comments that he made on Twitter. But Glenn says the games this week pretty well proved the four teams in the college football playoff was correct. I don't think anybody can argue with that. The only thing I would have said is, did Georgia belong in? Yeah. <laughs> After they, I mean, yes, that was the, the third string for, for Florida State or second string for Florida State, but uh, Georgia just looked overwhelming. I, I'm not so sure that that Alabama just didn't kind of surprise Georgia uh, again, the SEC championship. Um, yep. it, it, I'll, I will say this too. If I'm, boy, you want to talk about coaching points, et cetera. Um, if I'm an Alabama fan this morning uh, to have a quarterback dive play as your <laughs> – as your go-to on fourth and two in the in overtime, uh, I'm not so sure I would be really happy about that one. So that's that's uh, that's the goat, by the way, Nick Saban that ran that play. Uh, so <laughs> let's. There are always questions, right, uh, about coaching, about uh, players, etc. But football is a sport that you win some, you lose some. Uh, you just got to hope your guys give it their level best. And I, I felt like Texas, even though they were didn't execute well. They fought to the very end, and uh, that's that's the way it goes. All right, guys. Well, I believe our special guest is here, Coach Bob Shipley. So I'm going to bring him in. I don't – he may be – Looks like he may be frozen. Me. Looks like he may be frozen. <laughs> well, we, I tell you what, we will come up – maybe. <laughs> oh, there he is. I don't know if Coach can hear us yet. Let's uh, let's. Yeah, we'll, we'll we'll bring him back here in just a minute when he's ready. I tell you what, Bobby, let's run, run through some of these super chats real quick uh, while he fin- he finishes getting ready here. Yeah. Tub in Texas, uh, thank you, Tub. He says first and ten at the twelve. The play calling at the end, thumbs down. But, hey, I'll let I'll let CJ address that because he really talked about that post game. <clears throat> yeah, I thought at one point. After the A.D. Mitchell fade route to score, there was a little bit of a, well, it worked once before. Let's just keep doing it. And that's one of those things where, you know, you go back to the well one too many times and it's sure enough going to dry up. Also, I didn't understand. I do understand it, but I don't agree with it. The quick out to Jaden Blue. I know Texas wanted to get it down to about eight, seven yards to really start getting into the, the, the broader bag of tricks. But with 15 seconds left, every second matters. That the five seconds could have been another shot at the end zone. Texas somehow was able to squeeze four plays in inside of four, 15 seconds. Only two of those passes got to the end zone. If you want to win in a situation like that, you have to get as many passes beyond that goal line as you can. And so I'm not I, – I, like I said, I, I get it. I understand it. I don't agree with it. Yeah. I, I, I think they were trying to get it to seven to eight yards. So that they could, th- so that the quick slant would come into bigger play, right? So that the receiver would really have a two-way go, CJ. Yeah. Um, you know, and the thing that that was interesting to me uh, for him or, or for Texas is the red zone issues came back to came back home to roost yesterday. You think about it, Texas had two shot two attempts in the red zone in the final two minutes, two and a half minutes of the game. Okay, they only came away with three points. Um, Sark in the red zone has some work to do in the offseason. I think Quinn Ewers in the red zone has some work to do in the offseason. Um, he's not a rifle it in there guy, and he may start to have to learn that part of his game. I think that rifle it in there part would have uh, would have paid off on that yep. final play, unfortunately. <laughs> but I, I'm with you. That's the next step in his game 
the development from a year two to a year three kind of guy is 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 big of of, of play time for me. Yep. All right, guys, we're going to move on to the next Super Chat. This one from Juan. Thank you, Juan. He says, Texas should make a change with coaching. Either move Joseph for recruiting to safeties coach and get some, a coach from the NFL like Sark did with wide receiver coach. How about Jerry Gray or Al Harris? Bobby? Um, I don't I don't think there's going to be any moves there, guys. I mean, I don't, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. I mean, Blake Gideon just had his best recruiting campaign of – his young career. Um, Terry Joseph is a long-term uh, college assistant whose brother was an NFL head coach. It, it, the, sorry, do not be overreactionary. If we would have been overreactionary, P, PK would have never made it to year two. I mean, let, let's just be <laughs> that we, we do not do that. That that's, that's the, that's a recipe for, you know, chaos. You yeah. don't just get that. You don't just do that for absolutely no reason, in my opinion. The staff turnover after making the college football playoff. Uh, not yeah. what I want to sign up for. <laughs> it doesn't make sense, right, CJ? Right. No, I'm I'm with it. Okay. I'm, keep it all. Yeah. All right, guys. We're gonna try this again now and try to bring in Coach Shipley. I think he's <laughs> ready. So, Coach Shipley, how you doing this morning? I'm in the great outdoors. How are y'all doing? Hey, that looks, that almost looks like a, are you, is that a fake, uh, a fake background or is that a real background? That's Heck a no. real background. Heck no. That's <laughs> real. <laughs> I'm in Burnett, Texas this morning. <laughs> it looks My good. Man. Those old, those old, old trees look good, man. Hey coach, yeah. uh, I know you were watching it, uh, sitting on pins and needles and watching the game the entire day, night last night. A couple of key takeaways for you from it. Well, I didn't listen. I hadn't been listening to the show this morning because I told my wife, I said, I don't want to listen because I won't have anything to say. I won't say what y'all have already said. So I want you to know I haven't heard anything you guys have said. <laughs> I caught the end of uh, making staff changes, and I believe that's a mistake too. But, um, you know, I thought the uh, I thought the game was, uh, you know, obviously was very telling in a lot of ways. I'm sure that's no secret. But I thought the 77-yarder the from Penix to Polk, was just, a, I mean, if you had to take one pass play out to me that exemplified what happened last night, that game, it was that play. I mean, it was just, it wasn't a luck. It wasn't a dropped it in, you know, per, whatever. It just happened time after time after time. And, um, you know, obviously uh, Penix is everything we thought he was and maybe a little bit more, you know. That guy's got ice water in his veins. He's one of the best uh, pure passers I've ever seen in college football. Uh, and, you know, again, we talked about the matchup, Bobby, with uh, the defensive line and, you know, the pressure they could put on them. And that was, you know, that was obviously not not an issue, unfortunately, for us. And then, of course, uh, you know, Xavier and, and Mitchell were non-existent in the first half. And who would have thought that? I mean, you know, there's, there's a lot of things. I just uh, probably, like most of you guys feel, uh, I, I mean, it's hard to say this. I felt like the best team won. You know, I really do. I, I think we it, it exposed us maybe in some areas we that maybe we're not as elite as we thought we were. Uh, of course, that's, you know, that's. I don't know. I, I I think that's accurate. I may need to watch the game again and and see if I can come up with maybe something a little more positive. But I just think that's a, uh, you know, that's the 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 fact of, of where we're at. I think we're close. You look at what uh, Penix did with the ball, and then when you looked at uh, at Quinn throwing, it was like it was the ball was in slow motion. It was just like you know, just lobbing it into you know receivers, and Penix was just you know just throwing darts, you know, throwing ropes, and that's hard for that's hard for DB when balls are placed as well as they were placed. You know, you can talk about, uh, you know, I still think we're having trouble. Um, with the, you know, when the, when the ball is coming in, when, when the defensive back has not been able to adjust to the football, that's, but it's not a problem that just we have. It's a problem all over football. You see it at every level. Um, but I mean, those passes were, were perfect. I mean, they were just perfect. So say what you will about secondary, obviously we need some improvement, you know, in that area, but I, I just think it, what he was throwing out there, what he was doing was magical. And there wasn't, 
much that we were going to do that was going to, you know, take away. I thought, you know, I thought the fumble was huge, obviously, you know, Baxter's fumble, but, but so was Washington's muffed uh, punt return, you know, so, you know, just a couple of things here and there, but that, I thought that fumble gave them the momentum in the second half to, to get a two score lead maybe. And, and, uh, you know, put us in a, a more difficult position. And then of course we just couldn't get that, that stop on that last drive when they got the field goal. That was, uh, you know, we, we all knew that was the game. Yeah. I, I, I tell you what, that, that pass, you mentioned by putting the ball where it needed to be. I mean, he hit that, that go route to a uh, that put them in field goal range. Mm-hmm. I mean, he couldn't, he hit a postage stamp with that. I mean, yeah. That, yeah. That was uh, at one point in the game, Penix was 21 of 24 uh, passing. He was just on fire. Texas had twice. Texas had free rushers at him. I mean, Ethan Burke came in untouched. He redirected yeah. him yeah. and threw a touchdown pass. Yeah. Another time, Byron Murphy looked like he was going to decapitate yeah. Mike Bennix. And he, he sure did. He shucked him. He, he shucked him and moved him and uh, hit, threw a dart over the middle for a first down. I mean, y- your point was, and I agree with this, it's hard to beat a quarterback that's 21 to 24. I mean, that, yeah. good luck, right? I mean, that – they were moving the ball very easy. Yeah, they were. And, and I, I was a little disappointed in some of our protection schemes. I thought maybe we would uh, offensively, you know, go, going back to offense, I, I, I was a little bit disappointed in our, in our protection scheme. I don't think we um, fortified it like I thought we would, you know. for the DN was what we thought he was yeah. and more. And plus they kept moving him around, you know. He, he wasn't just coming off a certain edge every time. and. And, uh, you know, poor Christian Jones, he had, he had a long night. That was a, you know, penalties and, you know, whole, uh, just, just trying to contain a beast. It just, just wasn't happening for him last night. But I I think, uh, you know, I think I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of this team. I love the, I love where we're going. Uh, and, and, and I had, uh, I think all of us probably in the back of our mind were, were thinking, ah, are we, you know, maybe we can play for it all, but are we really quite there yet? You know, I just, I was hoping that we were, and I think last, last night probably uh, showed us that we're not, not quite where we hoped that we were, but I certainly think we'll, we'll be there. Yeah. Coach, thanks for joining us this morning. Uh, excuse the voice. It was a long night inside the, <laughs> the sugar, uh, the, the Superdome, but I'm with you. I think Texas is a very talented team, just a little, you know, a couple pieces short of really, jumping to where they wanted to be for that national championship title stage. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you about Quinn because it was a slow start for, for that Texas offense. Uh, I would say uncharacteristically, a lot of batted passes in that intermediate, you know, early short range, but he really started picking it up in that second half. No turnovers from yours. Uh, at the end of the day, Texas was in the position to win the game in large part because what he was able to do with the football. How how did you grade what you saw from number three uh, from beginning to end as the game progressed? How, how did you feel that he really started to come along there? Well, I I think your description is is pretty accurate with with what I had you know my, my thoughts on him. I think uh, you know it was just really uh, for the first time I. I uh, I, I didn't feel like he had a, a strong arm as I thought he had, but that's because he was going against the Nolan Ryan of college football. You know, um, <laughs> I think, uh, I think Quinn was, um, I don't think he had his best game. I, I think he was, he played well enough, you know, for us uh, to win, you know, 12 games that we won this year. But uh, I don't think he was, I don't think he was at a championship level, you know, last night. I, I thought our running game, you know, we started off with a with a good running game. Uh, felt like we had some success, maybe, but you know, we we got behind and couldn't c- couldn't hit hit our rhythm again. But you know, the fact that uh, who was it, Muhammad that that was covering Xavier, what a great job he did. I mean, I don't know if if they had help over the top with Xavier. It's hard to tell on the TV, but you know, the lack of of uh, you know, effort, I think, to get him the ball. I don't know if that was designed, uh, you know, with our with his reads or, or whatever. But when, when you take away your top receiver, basically, for three quarters of the game, 
um, that's a guy he's depended on all year, you know, and for whatever reason, it wasn't happening with it. Again, I'd have to, I'd have to see, you know, a wide, a wide angle of the, of the film and <clears throat> an end zone copy to see exactly what they were doing to take away Xavier. But, um, uh, I, I think, uh, I think I still think Quinn is a is a championship caliber quarterback. I really do. He's just not Michael Penix, you know. And I don't know that anybody in college football is, uh, you know, at this point. I think you know we all we all had the thought running through our mind. Geez, this guy did win the Heisman. Are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah. But uh, and, and Quinn's not Quinn's just that's just not Quinn. That's that's just not what he does. He's a game manager, and uh, you know he keeps his cool pretty well. I think. He's not uh, he's not great at avoiding the rush, but he's 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 been adequate most of the season. So uh, I I would give him probably a B minus last night. I mean, if I was if I was grading, but you know it's it's tough uh, it's tough when you've had a you know a team has had weeks to get ready for you and they're throwing stuff at you you hadn't seen and your offensive line is not really you know giving you a whole lot of time and they've taken away your best receiver uh, or your top receiver. Yeah, it's it's difficult. I'm not making excuses for him, but I I think probably um, that's that's my thoughts. No, I don't know. This is good. Yeah, this is I, great, Coach. We, we want your we want we want your uh, your your opinions because I think yeah, I don't want to, It's easy to be a Debbie Downer the the day after, and I don't want to do that. Quinn's yeah. a great guy. He's done a great job. Brought our program back to the national level, and um, you know, but it's hard when you're watching a game like that. And, you know, you, you look at Sark being the offensive passing guru that he is, uh, even even though he's, you know, been very effective running the ball and you go, OK, our quarterback was not on the level of our opponent, you know, last night. And that you can't say that a lot this past season, but you could sure say it last night. Well, uh, here's the reality in, the, in what I was saying last night, too. Look, they had three projected first round picks. Washington did. Michael Penix. Did he play like a first round pick last night? Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Roma Dunze, the wide receiver. Yeah. Did he Absolutely. play like the first round pick? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Braylon Trice is the other projected first round pick. Did yeah. he play like a first round Absolutely. pick? Absolutely. Okay. So that, yeah. that, that, those three guys, it wasn't necessarily the supporting cast. Those three guys came out and played a great game. That's a um, great analysis. That's that, that 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 hits it right on the head right there. Yeah, I mean, what no what are you supposed to do? Those guys are elite. We can say that Washington is supposed to be uh, – Texas is supposed to have more talent than Washington, yada, yada, yada. The NFL doesn't think so, at least not at that high level, right? Yeah. Texas yeah. had – I mean, Jade Barron's going to play years in the league, right? We're, we're not saying that. But he didn't make a big play last night, Yeah. right? Um, and that's not a knock on Jade Barron. It's just the way it is sometimes. Yeah. Right? When you play a better team and – I think your thought was was accurate, actually, that, look, Texas, midway through the third quarter, you didn't feel like they could stop Washington effectively, and you saw Texas having issues being consistent moving the ball. Yeah. I mean, that's – that, and that when we thought – when we saw that, we had to all think, okay, Washington's controlling the game, which they were. Um, I have a question for you. If you're, if you're a head coach and you're Kellen DeBoer, how are you not kneeling the ball three times? <laughs> yeah, no kidding. I mean, yeah. <laughs> because the, at best, Texas gets the ball back with like 15 to 20 seconds on its own 20, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. but he played around, running back gets hurt, that stops the clock, makes it a 25-second clock instead of a 40-second clock. Yeah. Then they they co Texas coaxes – this is actually pretty good by Texas, the special teams unit – coaxed a false start that then – stops the clock altogether. Well, I mean, and, and all of a sudden, a couple of big plays. I mean, if you're Kellen DeBoer and you're the national coach of the year, are you rethinking your idea to not yeah. just kneel it three times? <laughs> well, you you you've got to have somebody in the, you know, we always had somebody in the box that has it figured out that's a lot smarter than me that could say, okay, now we can't kneel it yet. Or when it, you know, and and there's there's a plan that you go by based on you know, how many timeouts you have and how much time is on the clock and how many downs you have. But yeah, there's no doubt. I think, if, you know, that's certainly one thing that they'll, I'm sure get corrected <laughs> before next Monday, because that, that would have been uh, the biggest blunder of the 23 season. Uh, let me ask you this, uh, uh, 
Washington next week, they're not a good matchup for Michigan, right? Michigan is just such a brutally bruising team. Um, but if they somehow get the, the passing game going, what, what are your thoughts there uh, about Michigan? I think Washington? it's going to, I think it's a great matchup. It's, it's two, two totally different teams, but I think that uh, Washington is, is a bet. I mean, overall, they're, they're a better team than I thought they were. They, they really are. I mean, those, those guys may believe, you know, you can say all you want about the pac 12 and, you know, but, it's it's going to be a great matchup. It's 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 you know, obviously teams offensively that are on you know polar opposites. But um, I I can't wait I can't wait to watch it. Uh, gotcha. I mean I, I don't I don't know what I don't know what Mich I haven't looked at Michigan much this year. I've seen them play twice or maybe three times, but I don't know what their secondary is like. But if Pinnock is throwing like he was last night, uh, that's <laughs> going to keep him in the game anyway. Hey, Coach, you've been uh, in situations like this where you had a really good run as a team, right? And you've won state championships where you've lost games, right? and, and you've circled back and won cha state championships the next year, right? You, you lost a, a team like Steve Sarkeesian's today, or last night, lost a game, but there's still a program to run, right? How did you, when you lost a disappointing playoff game, and you had to get ready for the next year. How did you kind of set that mentality or set that focus and refocus the team going into the next year? Like what, what's the kind of secret sauce there that Sark has to be thinking about right now? Well, I think you, you, you got to keep, well, and your description of me is not totally accurate, but I understand, understand where you're, understand where you're going with it. But, you know, I think, I think the biggest thing that we've got to do in this program that Sark has to do is keep, keep our kids, and, and our culture with a chip on the shoulder, you know, because uh, it's been, um, golly, it's been a long time since a team has had as much praise as this team has had heaped on them uh, these past few weeks. And, uh, well, I mean, you know, we started out the season. I mean, you know, there was a lot of high expectations. But somehow, if you can keep a chip on the shoulder, have a dog mentality, because – it's so easy at the University of Texas. Trust me, I've been there. I worked there five years. Those guys are, uh, they're not coddled, but they have the best of everything. And you have everybody in your ear. And that's one thing that Tom Herman always said that I appreciated. Turn down what you hear outside and turn up what's going on inside. You can't listen to all the stuff, good or bad. It doesn't matter. You can't listen to what they're saying outside. You've got to listen to and, and only focus on what we need in the culture of our program. Now, you know, obviously he wasn't successful, you know, as, as he would like to have been doing that, but I thought that was a great analogy. And I think that's what Sark has to do. First of all, they got to keep recruiting their tails off, continuing to get the, you know, the elite players, but somehow you've got to set a, a tone in that program of a, of a, that well, we call it, a, you know, Rod and I, and you, you know, it's a dog mentality. It's just like, you know, I'm here to fight. I'm here to scrap. I, I don't care. You know, you can go out in the middle of pasture. We, we just want to get it on, you know, and that's the kind of mentality that we've got to continue to get uh, in, in that in that locker room. And I, and I think I think we have it now. Whether we keep it depends on the staff's emphasis. Uh, and, you know, I, I, that, that that's what I always try to do. If I couldn't find a chip on our shoulder, I would manufacture one. Unfortunately, <laughs> I would make up a story about how they were spitting on our logo at midfield. <laughs> you know, or whatever, you know, <laughs> because it's, it, it's, it's, it, it, there's nothing more comforting than having your guys come out. I had uh, a buddy of mine was, was playing, um, we were playing new Bromples and, and I it, it kind of made up a little story before, before the game. And my guys come out and he goes after the game, he goes, we won, we weren't supposed to. And he said, why were your guys so mad at us? They came out of the locker room and they were just like, looking at us like we had run over their cat or something. You know, I, go, I don't know. They were ready to play, you know. But anyway, you've got to do that for a whole season. You've got to have you got to have that chip all season. And and I think you still got to have a chip on your shoulder when you're out recruiting. I know there was a time when Mac would say, listen, don't offer a kid unless you want him because you're going to get him if you offer him. And we're not at that level yet, but it seemed like we kind of got a little laxed on our recruiting, you know, in the late 2000, uh, 2000 you know, nine, 10, 11, 12, you know, we just, we just didn't have that same intensity, the same tenacity 
and we just started taking some guys, I think, uh, because it was easy to get them instead of really raking through every program, every information that you can get and just finding the guys that now, and now we can do that. Not only elite players, but guys that have that dog mentality here that, you know, I, I'd love Casey Studdard. Casey Studdard is a guy I always go to. You need about 22 Casey Studdards on the field <laughs> and everything's going to be all right. You know, <laughs> you, you will definitely extract the most of yourself in uh, from the minute the whistle starts to the minute the whistle blows. Yeah, Derek you, Johnson. Give me give me 11 Derek Johnsons on defense <laughs> and give me 11 Studdards on offense and we're going to be all right. <laughs> That's pretty good. Coach, hey, man, we appreciate you. Uh, that background you see is real. Uh, Coach real, uh, it runs a company, a real estate company called Shipley Ranches. Uh, go to ShipleyRanches.com. Coach, we'll be talking to you soon. You and Rod got football theory. Y'all can dive into a little bit more of the X's and O's of what happened uh, this Can't coming wait. Thursday. All right, man. Can't wait. Take, take care, bud. Thanks, Thanks Coach. guys. Thanks, Coach. Yeah. Hug them. All right. Always. Be good. I love Coach Shipley, man. Good stuff, Coach. Really good stuff. Uh, yep. You know, he, he's got the perspective of a coach. Like, we're talking about it, guys. He's got the perspective of, look, you're going to lose in football, but you got to move forward. And how do you move forward? And he's talking about recruiting uh, and keeping in, – in we. how many times did we mention the term culture this offseason? I mean, how many times? Like a 1,000? That culture Texas wants to keep. And you have to keep the dog mentality that you talked about while also increasing the level of talent within the program incrementally. It's not like this wasn't a, a talented team this year, but keep improve, improving it piece by piece. And all of a sudden you end up with a, a better team that continues that to have that, uh, that culture uh, that I think is, is so good. I, I want to mention this on recruiting before we go forward. Uh, Texas continues to recruit Jamari Caldwell. Uh, the uh, the defensive lineman out of the University of Houston. He's in the transfer portal. We'll see exactly what comes of it. We will we will know more once the uh, once uh, official visits can get going again. Uh, call welcome continues to be a piece. Also in the transfer portal, uh, Texas right now monitoring to see if anybody goes in late. The transfer portal closes today officially. Although there is a forty eight hour window of notice uh, that teams may hold back. Uh, players to try to get them to, to rescind their entrance into the portal. Uh, so we'll have to wait and see that. But they're also looking for a, a safety, uh, potentially a tight end, based on uh, JT Sanders' decision here. Uh, Sanders, by the way, led the team in receiving uh, last night. Uh, and then also uh, they're still looking for that interior defensive lineman uh, as well as a potential one at uh, wide receiver, somebody that can literally uh, be a number one for you at wide receiver. That's what they're looking for in the portal. Uh, Caldwell, though, someone to keep your eye on as we go into the month of January. All right, guys. Well, you're watching Coffee and Football on On Texas Football, and we got uh, plenty of questions to get to, plenty of super chats. But before we do that, Bobby, I need to tell everybody out there about Manscaped. And cheers to the new year from our friends at Manscaped because your resolutions shouldn't be the only thing that are well kept. 2024 is the time for new heights, new opportunities, and a new look for your Times Square balls. Manscaped's Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra is every man's cheat code to look good, feel good, and turn the page on confidence this year. Whether you're looking to maintain a trim or go for that clean shaven look, this trimmer has you covered. Trusted by over 10 million men worldwide, now is your time to get a grip on your grooming with their exclusive offer. Just go to manscaped.com and use promo code ONTEXAS for 20% off plus free shipping. Happy New Year or happy new balls. And introducing the MVP of 2024, Manscaped's fifth generation lawnmower. It's not just a trimmer, it's your grooming sidekick. It's equipped with two skin safe blade heads, a standard one for taking a little off the top, and a new foil blade to go smooth wherever your heart desires. It's like having a personal stylist at your fingertips or, well, wherever you need it. And let's face it, resolutions might come and go, but a well-groomed view is here to stay thanks to Manscaped. So get 20% off and free shipping with the code ONTEXAS at manscaped.com because nothing says Happy New Year like a deal that leaves your balls and your budget feeling refreshed. Embrace a new you and definitely embrace a new trimmer courtesy of Manscaped. 
I will never understand how you're able to do that with no emotion ever, <laughs> ever, hey, ever. Lots ever. of radio practice, Bobby. Lots. Of I, radio practice. I would guess so. It has to be something because I couldn't say that with a straight face to save my it's life. It's a funny read. Uh, I could not, I couldn't say that with a straight face to save my life. I mean, ever. <laughs> I will say, I will say, I can't look at you while I'm reading it. <laughs> <laughs> because I can look at CJ just fine. It doesn't bother me. But if I watch you, it, it, it I just, I'll lose it. So I, I have to look away from you while doing it. But I'm 54 years old. There's a reason that I, mean, I just, you know. Oh, man. It's, uh, it's difficult. All right, enough making Bobby uncomfortable. We're gonna get we're gonna get to some super chats here, guys. And this first one from Michael. I want to thank Michael Cluckhorn here. He says, even after overachieving in a great season, I think it's ridiculous how many everyday Joes that at best the rode the bench in middle school think they know it, know it all, and how they can fix the problems. Well, that's the beauty of the internet. Yeah, it's it's not just the beauty of the internet. Let you know, it's also the beauty of fandom. I mean, everybody like we're at the end of the day, we're we're pontificating what can be done as well to improve. Right. So our opinion isn't necessarily all the ways that much different than somebody else's. It's I, I don't want to I don't want to poke and prod at, at different uh, people for their opinions, et cetera. I, my you know, my feeling on that is it's part of just being that bell curve of fandom. Right. You have the ones that, oh, the coaches are always right. Or the other part of the bell curve, the coaches are always wrong. Fire them all. And, you know, we're, we all fit somewhere in the, on that bell curve, uh, I, I think. And uh, uh, this year, hopefully, most people are right in the middle because the, fa the, the, the or exactly on the left-hand side of keeping everything going because Texas just had a wonderful season. I mean, they, they really did. Yes, there are things we can nitpick. But you know what? I could nitpick uh, Jim Harbaugh yesterday. I could do it with Kellen DeBoer with the, how he ran the last one minute of the clock. I could nitpick it with Nick Saban, who's the greatest of all time, running a quarterback dive with on fourth and two. So, you know, it, nitpicking is one thing. But overwhelming distaste for what happened, that's not, that's not healthy, in my opinion. And to your point, Michael. I got this next super chat here uh, is from William Niche, and William says, this game illustrates the need for that impact edge rusher. An impact edge rusher, two wipes away six to eight of those pass completions of 20 yards or more. CJ? Yeah, uh, I think we'll see steps taken with Burke and uh, um, Baron Sorrell next year. Obviously, adding... Uh, Trey Moore into the fold will help, as well as a Colin Simmons that will help. But I, I wanted to go back to my point about the, the X factor, Bobby, coming into this game. I know you, you you asked me to get a guy that wasn't a Christian Jones or a Calvin Banks, but that was really what it came down to, in my opinion, when you talk about the negative plays that Washington was able to create in the passing game. Washington had 14 pressures last night. Eight of them came from Braylon Trice. Not a single other Washington pass rusher had multiple pass er, pressures on Quinn Ewers. There are six others that had one total pressure. Braylon Trice had more pressures than the rest of his team combined and was in the backfield so often. He had two sacks, obviously. Uh, that was ultimately what stalled the Texas offense very early in the game. And it was ultimately, you know, something that Texas ended up lacking. You know, Penix had a, a clean jersey all night. Texas didn't get him on the ground. I, I, you know, you mentioned that, and I, we don't even talk. We talk about the first down play with the four plays left in the game where they threw it to Jaden Blue. But Texas really only had two shots at the end zone because Braylon Trice broke through on the third down play and almost sacked Quinn Ewers. Yeah. I mean, so your point's well taken. I go back to the fact that, uh, you know, those three guys – are all first round picks and they played like first round picks. All three of those guys will go higher than Tavondre Sweat. And they're I mean, all very old. Yes. Very experienced. Yeah, exactly. I agree. So uh, good stuff, CJ. And you're right. I mean, I'm man enough to say Kelvin Banks did not have the greatest game. He had a, a very untimely um, uh, motion penalty. Uh, yeah. But uh, Christian Jones, uh, Braylon Trice was just too much. Uh, last night. Yeah. 
I got this next super chat from A Mars. Thank you, A Mars. And he says it was a fantastic season, way beyond my expectations. What are the lessons learned from this game and season? And how do we tighten up the secondary? I see it as you know now that Texas is ready for whatever is ahead of them. Texas has the fundamental pieces to build a consistently highly competitive program on a national scale. This was only in year three. You know, the guys that Sarkeesian has recruited, they're they're on the field, they're playing. But those big, you know, instant game changers that we're waiting on to, to really take over are probably a year or two away. So I think to see where this team went in year three under Sarkeesian is – I mean, really, the, the the biggest takeaway that I can I can take I can have from this season and just say what a ride it was, but also looking ahead to the future and saying that <laughs> it's it sure sure is pretty bright. So uh, that that's that's for me where I stand. Well, you look at the secondary in uh, Andrew Makuba is coming in next year. That's gonna be a, that's gonna be helpful. They're still looking for another safety in the portal as well. So you ask about the secondary; uh, those are key pieces. Uh, Muhammad uh, uh, will be back as well. Um, and, you know, you think uh, Terrence Brooks too. So I, I don't feel like the secondary is getting worse next season, even though they're going to lose Jade Barron and probably Ryan Watts. I think the secondary will actually get better um, over time. And to CJ's point, it may take a year or two for some of these young guys to blossom, like Derek Williams, who was a complete non-factor. Um you know, but but I, if, if my lessons and, and takeaways are uh, somewhat similar to CJ, the the blueprints there now for Steve Sarkeesian, and you can tell that he's actually built the foundation, right? And so now it's about you know let's let's build the skyscraper, right? <laughs> let's take this and take it from a, a an eight floor an eight floor uh, you know skyscraper to a you know fifty six floor skyscraper down in downtown Austin and make it, you know, a shining example of what can be done in college football. That's kind of where I'm at. And, and I think they've got, like, I think they've got the right pieces in place. And I think Sark puts the right emphasis on the right things. I really do. I mean, he's all about recruiting. He's all about uh, out scheming coaches in, in offense and getting the right quarterback in place. I and mean, look, Texas, the better quarterback won last night. And that happens what ninety five percent of the time in college football, basically. I mean, that's that's how it works. All right, y'all. This next super chat here um, is from Seth, and Seth says we need true pass rushers. Kind of going back to what we were talking about a minute ago. Need true pass rushers, guys who just know how to get the quarterback on the ground, more speed and coverability at safety, and more development from Quinn. Otherwise, we are where we need to be. Is that a fair assessment? I, I see both, both me and CJ shaking our head. Yes, right, CJ. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, I I feel like they've got it. They've got it going in the right direction. Uh, if I had to say something or or add something uh, to that, it you know Rod mentioned this in post game. It wasn't the safeties that they picked on. It was the corners last night. You think about it. Michael Taft wasn't picked on. Derek Williams wasn't picked on. Uh, you know, it was it was even even Jade Barron was more picked on than the safeties. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it, it was Ryan Watts, Terrence Brooks. Their receivers are just really good. They had they had that capacity. So, uh, but going forward, I think everything. I think the foundation is laid. Now they need to just go out and continue getting these quarterbacks. Can continue getting a speed rusher. Although I will say this. And you may mentioned this uh, this morning, CJ, in our first go round. Uh, I feel strongly uh, that uh, Ethan Burke eventually is going to turn into a whale of a football player for Texas. I, I think that he is just now um, scratching the surface of who he can become. I'm I mean, he's you. he's got a chance. He's got a chance to be an elite edge rusher. You don't know it because he's only a true sophomore. But you add another 15, 20 pounds and keep that quickness. That's going to be tough for anybody. Yeah. And the motor. He's got a hell of a motor, too. 
Yep. Bobby, I, I just real quick, that analogy of building the foundation, it's like 2021, you get the rights and the, the, the permits to start building. 2022, you get the blueprint. You understand that you have some pieces. You might have something special here. 2023, you know, that first layer of concrete is built. And as we go into 2024, that's when the stilts and all the, the high rising and, and cranes start moving in to start going, you know, high. So that's, that's how my, my brain just popped into right there. I like that analogy a lot. Yeah. And you're moving. Uh, the only thing is you're moving blocks. So you, you, you thought you were going to be on sixth and Guadalupe and now you're on sixth and new aces because you're moving to the sec. So that, <laughs> <laughs> that's, the, that's the other analysis, right? <laughs> All right, Joe, we got one more super chat here. This one from Justin Yarbrough, and he says, we don't have speed in the secondary like we want. The guys played hard, but what would y'all think about moving Brooks to nickel and adding a corner from the portal to go with the young guys coming in? I don't hate that idea, Justin. Also, thank you for the super chat. Uh, Texas has a very talented group of guys coming in right now. Uh, there's obviously some guys I think Texas is very high on, from last year's cycle, obviously Malik Muhammad's going to be a guy that plays a long time in a Texas uniform. I don't think a necessary uh, an impact corner from the portal is 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 at the top of the priority list. I think with Ter Terrence Brooks and Malik Muhammad, you have two guys who are still underclassmen, still. Kind of young. I mentioned it last night in the post game. You don't want a lot of young inexperience in a secondary. And uh, we saw it a little bit last night start to bite Texas. But I think with those two guys right there, I know Texas likes to rotate their, their corners and secondaries a lot. Those two guys are guys that I'd like to build on on the outside as, as your true corners. I thought they both had very good, impressive years this year. Uh, Terrence Brooks started to come around. He was very good to begin the season, uh, was receiving, you know, all conference honorees. I think pro football focus even was, was touting him as one of those guys that had, you know, over 200 snaps and not a single touchdown allowed. So I liked what I saw from both cornerbacks this year. I, I'm not sure I would go out and change uh, what Texas will be having on the field next year. I, I think you can look at Terrence Brooks at safety. Um, I just don't know if he has the eyes for safety as opposed to corner. He's, he's worked so hard at corner with his dad, you know, Chet. Um, and I don't know that he necessarily has – like, I, I do think Texas is looking for more speed, even than Jade Barron at the yeah. nickel. And Makuba has that. So, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Uh, a couple of guys we didn't see much of. We didn't see much Jalen Gilbo last mm -hmm. night, if, it, if any at all. Um, Derek Williams, I think, really only played a couple series. Um, so they've got some guys in the secondary that we got to figure out what's going on. Jelani McDonald, uh, Warren Roberson, those guys uh, will be added to the mix this spring. Spring ball only it starts in a couple months, by the way. Crazy. I mean, I, I mean, it's getting ready to go. We got it's. I love. I love. There's so so many things about college football that are kind of interesting to me, like the 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 introduction of the transfer portal now, at CJ has made this a year-round thing. I mean, it really has, because now we're going to be waiting. Not only are we finishing up the transfer portal now, but right after spring ball is concluded, the month of May is going to be all about the transfer portal again. Yeah. And then you walk into June, and that's official visit period. And then you walk into July, and maybe the coaches get a week off, um, and then you begin it again. Um, anybody – let me ask you all this, Blake, and you, you, uh, you are, are – probably a good person to ask is there anything that you sat back and looked at last night as kind of a you know just wondering to yourself you know what is texas missing in this in this game like what do you think were they missing a pass rusher were they missing a go-to running back maybe last night i mean because jonathan brooks was out what what were they missing in this game no i'm with you on the pass rusher that's actually my first thought that and, man, it drove me crazy. And I was actually talking to one of the defensive backs off the 05 National Championship team throughout the game last night. We had a really good conversation. But the defensive back's not turning their heads, you know. And I was asking him, what's the deal there? What's the deal there? And, and we had a pretty in-depth conversation on it. And he, he felt the same way I did. And we, I've seen a lot of questions in the chat, too, you know. But, I mean, I think from uh, pass rusher number one, but I, I'd also, I'm also curious about the the DBs not turning their heads because you didn't see it at all last night, or if you did, it was when it was way too late. 
Yeah, they don't have a ball hawk unless it's Manny Muhammad in the secondary. Maybe Derek Williams becomes that at a sa- as a safety. Um, but I, 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 I hear you. I, I think pass rusher is going to be key. They got to get that. I mean, but again, they had two free shots at Penix, and he just made them look like yeah. they were moving in slow motion. I mean, he's, he's an elite dude. I mean, I don't. I know people are going to try to minimize him at, at some level, and it was just Texas, et cetera. But those were those were NFL plays. Yeah, I, just real quick, I did see the tweet. If you want to take solace in this, Texas was undefeated against right-handed quarterbacks this year. <laughs> I thought that was pretty good. I got a chuckle out of it this morning whenever I woke yeah, up. Seven percent, seven percent of the United States is left-handed, so <laughs> Texas can be okay. Only seven percent of the teams they play will have left-handed quarterbacks, probably. And it's worth mentioning the only two teams they lost to six-year quarterbacks. That's that's even more interesting if you want to think about it, because maybe that's maybe that's PK's kryptonite. You know, quarterbacks that really understand what they're trying to do on offense. On the flip side of that, that should give Texas fans so much, I guess, even more optimism about 2024 and the jump that Quinn will make again because we saw it this year from last year and we know just how important more game experiences especially in big games like this where I didn't think Quinn was that great but he figured it out in the second half in the fourth quarter specifically that jump next year that he will continue to make is going to be something that you are that you see is very evident in my opinion all right, y'all, we got another super chat. This one from Mike Gosnell. Thank you, Mike. And he says, is it time to be concerned about the developmental skills of Terry Joseph and Blake Gideon? How confident are you in Texas making the 12-team playoff next year? So a twofer. I'm not concerned about the development skills of Joseph and Gideon. Um, I, look, I, they're they're NFL, they're NFL. They're quality coaches. I, I don't worry about that. I uh, Terrence Brooks... Uh, and Ryan Watts and Manny Muhammad, they played They played hard. Uh, they weren't perfect. They went up against a first-round receiver in Roma Dunze. They went up against a quarterback that was, you know, throwing bullets and, and you know, dotting eyes, basically. Um, as far as my confidence level in Texas making the uh, top 12 next year, I don't have confidence level in that. I, I would say it's definitely less than 50-50. That's, you know, that's my opinion. I mean, Texas would have to finish nine and three to even be nine and three or better. Uh, You look at their, their schedule right now. I mean, it's a, it's a tough schedule. I mean, I know it's not the murderer's row, but you have, you host Georgia. I mean, they're going to be as talented as any team Texas has seen. And, you know, I get maybe a long, long time. Right. Right. Um, We'll see. I, I do feel like they're headed in the right direction, uh, but I don't know that I have a, a better than a 50-50 conf- confidence that they'll be in the top 12 heading into uh, next playoff season. Give me – now, two years from now, let's – I would give you a better than 50-50 on that. That's that's kind of I, – I see a little – like if you're looking at Texas and, and trying to figure this out, I saw this was a, a little bit of a peak. I think we're going to see that and then this. So it's a little down next year, maybe, but then I think they go back to where where uh, where they've got it. I mean, that's what Sark's building, uh, in my opinion, and where the the strength of the team even is. All right, this next super chat, guys, from Damon. Want to thank Damon? He says the secondary played their butts off. Penix was baking cakes back there. PK should have sold out and pushed into a seventy to eighty percent blitz rate. Uh, yeah. Bringing pressure, bringing look, mixing looks would have been great. I, I agree, it should have been a little bit more often. I thought Anthony Hill on design blitzes from the middle would have been something Texas would, should have gone to a little bit earlier in that game. But we've seen how talented those receivers are going down the field in short, quick one on ones. That's something I'm not sure I, I wanted to task my my DBs with throughout the, the entirety of a game. Situationally, absolutely, the entire game. After what we just saw last night, I, I, I'm not sure much would have changed. Well, a blitz happened on that 70-something yard con, uh, completion to start the game. I mean, let's, <laughs> you know, they brought safeties one time. They brought, I mean, 
they tried. Guys, could have they have been better? Yes. Um, was it an F performance from the from what they? It wasn't because the other team was just really good. Yeah. I mean, you have to at some point you have to say, Michael Penix, you're pretty good. I mean, this is college football. It's not the NFL where every single person is a future NFL player. Um, and so you can like move people around like Lego pieces, right? That that's that's not what it is. I agree with CJ. I would have liked to have seen more pressure up the middle because that seemed to be maybe the only thing that kind of flummoxed Michael Penix last night was pressure up the middle, and he had to he had to release one way or the other. Otherwise, he he just moved around in the pocket too easily. Yeah, surprisingly, Penix moving up into the pocket and running the football was something that hurt Texas a lot more than I think many expected. Penix going left and right, Texas had a little bit more success with uh, in terms of creating incompletions or, or throwaways, whatever it might be. But that that edge pressure that we talked about allowed Penix to just step up and go, and that I'm not sure many expected 30 yards out of him that, last night. All right, y'all, this next question is from Ski Breck. And Ski says, what was Texas' biggest weakness and biggest strength this season? He's talking about position rooms. He doesn't want some abstract culture answer. Very specific there. Biggest strengths, I would say, is the improvement on the in the trenches. Without a doubt, uh, uh, clearly you have the best offensive tackle in the entire country, the best duo as well with Byron Murphy. The secret is adding an edge guide to that as well. Uh, while maintaining that pressure in the middle. I thought the offensive line, albeit didn't play a whole you know, perfect game last night. Braylon Trice was a, a game breaker as well uh, last night. But you lose two NFL quality running backs a year ago. You still run for, uh, you know, you still have Jonathan Brooks run for 1,200 yards almost. Your running backs after that, C.J. Baxter, Jaden Blue, each run for 100, uh, 100 yards a game, uh, a piece after that. Like these guys – and that, that, that offensive line took that step forward that I was hoping to see coming into the year. The next step in terms of pass protection is more, you know, Quinn Ewers not taking self-sacks. And so I think that's part of the development that we'll see again next year from Quinn. But also that the trenches for me are the two steps going forward. Bobby, I'd love to hear what you thought about maybe a, a, a position group that went backward. I think we might know an answer here having – Talk just a little bit about last night's game, but is there one that stood out to you otherwise? My strength was definitely the nose tackle or the defensive tackles. I, I think they were the clear strength of the team. Um, second would have been the wide receiver group, uh, you know, in the offensive skill position in general. Mm -hmm. I thought they had the tight end. They had the receivers. They had the running backs, even with Jonathan Brooks and Quinn Ewers development. So that was the strength of the team. Uh, the weakness of the team I thought uh, was pass protection at times. So that was a weakness, even though I thought they did well in run blocking, pass protection was a weakness at times against big time uh, rushers. And then also I would say the safeties and lack of speed overall in the secondary. They need, they need, uh, and so you can't pinpoint, hey, it was Ryan Watts or it was Jaron Thompson or it was Keaton Crawford or Michael, I mean, you can't just say it was one guy because I thought all of them, none of them are ideally fast except for maybe Derek Williams. Out of all that group that we talk about, maybe Manny Muhammad is on the cusp of that, right? So uh, those were the strengths and weaknesses in my opinion. All right, y'all, this next question here uh, is from Travis. And Travis asks, if Quinn comes back, is Arch given a legit shot to take the job? Here's my deal. You have a guy who just led your team to the college football playoff. He's returning for his third year as a starter in the system that he's known since he arrived in Austin. Arch could be a great talent. He is a great talent. You've not seen him do anything other than complete two passes and scramble for about 12 yards. This is the same issue that we saw with Oklahoma in their bowl game. Fans start clamoring for the next guy up. You never know that if those flowers are going to smell better than the ones that are sitting on your, your countertop in the kitchen already. I, I, don't, I, I understand it. I get the, the debate that 
folks want to have. I wholeheartedly disagree with telling Quinn not to come back, telling Quinn the job's not his. Competition is great. It, 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 it It's breeding better players. But that's going to be Quinn Ewers' job for as long as he's here. It's just a matter of the fact. Let's not pretend that Quinn was a bad quarterback. He had a great year in my eyes. I, I, look, I don't think – you don't push him out like they did Dylan Gabriel at OU. <laughs> I mean, I, look, no offense, but that didn't go over well. You know what I mean, CJ? Absolutely. I, I feel like I feel like you've got to take, take what you can um, and uh, put it out there because Texas, uh, at least at this point, uh, Quinn Ewers is the quarterback. Do I think there should be a competition? Absolutely. But I think there should be a competition at every spot. I don't think – Jake Majors comes back at center. I think that Cole Hudson should compete with him, right? I mean, doesn't mean Cole Hudson's going to take that job, but I, I I think healthy competition is great everywhere, including at quarterback. Uh, we have another super chat, guys. Only got time for just a couple more questions right here on Coffee and Football. Uh, Damon says not having Jonathan Brooks hurt, he would have had two hundred and fifty total yards. What do y'all think? And protected the ball better, maybe. And pass protection. Yep. Yeah, He's I mean, good the player. Biggest, uh, the biggest body in that room, most experience as well. It would have gone a long way in my eyes. Yeah. Would have, could have, should have. Yep. yep. All right, Ski Breck says, how many horns get drafted? He counts nine. It's a fun conversation that I'm glad Texas is finally in the mix to have. You know, <laughs> what might be you know a top three NFL class for for the for the, the the April draft, but I don't know off the top of my head. I feel like eight, seven or eight. You know, certainly feel like they're going to be hearing their names called. I'd have to go through draft prep is very fun for me, so I'm excited to get into that. I haven't a hundred percent yet. Let me know if you want to go to the Senior Bowl. Go down there and see those guys. I think that's fun. Yeah, no, that'd be I talked about maybe one of y'all, one of you two going down there and seeing those guys. Um, uh, I just tried to, off the top of my head here, A.D. Mitchell, Xavier Worthy, J.T. Sanders, Christian Jones, Byron Murphy, Tavondre Sweat, Jalen Ford, Jade Barron. Okay, the ones that I had are maybes. Jonathan Brooks, if he goes pro, Jordan Whittington may be late. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's eight that I think are for sure going to get drafted. Whittington and Brooks are, you know, depending on what I don't I don't know that Whittington will be a draft pick as much as be a, a undrafted free agent. Brooks, however, if he does go pro, I think he'll be drafted and that would make nine. Yeah. Bobby, you think I spoke with a I spoke with a, a draft scout probably a month and a half ago. So before, prior to the Jonathan Brooks injury, uh, which obviously ended the season, kind of derailed his trajectory. That scout told me that he had Jonathan Brooks as the number one running back in the country heading into the 2024 draft. That obviously has changed prior or, you know, as a result of the ACL. But prior to that, there was a lot of uh, excitement surrounding Brooks's game. So I, I'd like to see – I'll check back in and see just where everything went prior, or following that injury. Yep. All right, y'all. This is probably going to be the last question for today, and it's a loaded one from Kelly Hyden. And Kelly says, what lessons will Sark take from this loss? Will it impact strategy, recruiting, portal, et cetera? It seems like there should be a lot of takeaways from this game. I'm going to say – I want to – guys, we both need to answer this. Uh, CJ, you need to – and be thinking about yours while I'm talking about this. So there's a couple things. One is I think he needs to I think he needs to go further in his bag of tricks on the two running back package. Like I think that's one of the reasons he doesn't go back to it because he doesn't have as many iterations off of it that he would like to have. Does that make sense? Like it is clearly one of the things teams are having problems uh, guarding against right now. Um, but I think that part of the reason he doesn't use it more is because he doesn't have 25 plays off it. He has 10, right? And so how do you build on that success going into next year? Um, that's a takeaway for me. The other takeaway is, um, you know, how do you – like they clearly didn't come out strong 
in bowl prep after their bowl prep. I didn't think the first two quarters were great quarters for Texas, even though they were tied at the half. Um, you know, how do you prepare the team for a college football playoff run when they've been off for two weeks? Because this is two consecutive bowl losses for Sark, right? And both both of them to Washington, but you want to see Texas play better in bowls going forward. Um, CJ, you have anything that's major as far as strategy or game plan, et cetera? I, I think of it more as just approaching big games with a I, – I don't want to call it a more aggressive mentality, but there's moments where you know the magnitude of the moment that you're in. I thought the, the fourth down call on the 33-yard line by Kalen DeBoer was a tone setter. It was a we're going to go win this football game kind of decision. That's Kalen DeBoer having won championships at previous levels. That's Kalen DeBoer having experience and really kind of that that edge over Sarkeesian that Rod has mentioned throughout the, the, the bowl preparation. That's something that you only get through having lived it. Sarkeesian's first real game, I know he, he was won national title as an assistant, but as the head coach and the guy that's making all of the decisions and everything relies on what you have to say, that's something you only get by having lived it. I think yeah. – go ahead. No, and, and not having Tavondre Sweat and Byron Murphy on the field to defend against that was a – I mean, look, they were rotating in, but after a timeout and after a, a – you have to rotate those guys back in. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and that's a – call that has to come from the head coach yep you know it can't be well we were going to play these guys six plays and these guys six plays situational awareness a little bit there would have been helpful all right y'all well i am going to leave y'all with this let's see if i can find it here this from sark he says texas fight thank you longhorn <laughs> nation it's been a, a heck of a season it really was. And guys, look, those kids, they gave everything they had for you. I mean, the coaching staff did too. Sark didn't take a week of vacation this year. I mean, they gave everything they had. They came up short. You know what I mean? But it, it was a season that everybody, like when I started this broadcast this morning and I woke up uh, this morning, I was like, you got to be proud to be a Longhorn right now. I mean, even even with the outcome of the game, not that you shouldn't have been proud to be a Longhorn your entire life, et cetera, but this season has uh, reestablished Texas as a team of, uh, you know, a, a team to be reckoned with. No longer are you going to be worrying. I, I, Texas is not going to be worrying about beating an Oklahoma State. They'll, they'll go, they beat them 49 to 17 or 21. That No longer worried about beating a Texas Tech. They need to go worry about being uh, as good as they can be in the SEC. Uh, and I think that they're poised to do that. Um, it'll take a while. Um, and we'll, we'll see where it goes. But I look, my hat's off to Steve Sarkeesian and to the entire Texas uh, football team this morning, even though they came up short. Hell of a year. Um, and it made this team so fun to cover because – you know, and, and CJ, we never talked about this today, but the versatility of the wins for Texas and how many different people did it this year, it was a team. Absolutely. And people, I, I felt this as, as someone that talked to a lot of fans throughout this whole process. You could feel that people identified with it being a team as opposed to just the quarterback or just the defensive line or just the wide receivers. It felt like a team. JT Sanders all of a sudden becomes the leading receiver. I mean, all of that. Jonathan Brooks stepping up. Tavondre Sweat becoming going from a late round draft pick to maybe a first or second rounder. Like Jalen Ford coming back for an, another year. Jordan Witt. It felt like a team this year. Absolutely. Uh, and I think that people can can really uh, identify with that and root for that. And uh, that's what we got out of the 2023 team for the University of Texas. Time to build up on the foundation, Bobby. Yeah, I agree. I mean, that, let's keep adding pieces that have the dog mentality, uh, have a chip on the shoulder, uh, and uh, keep executing better. I mean, there's another year of Quinn Ewers, to your point. We still believe he's going to uh, stay and announce that at some point in the near future. But uh, 
big stuff. Uh, news, we forgot to mention this before we leave. I want to mention this, Blake. Anthony Williams became commitment number four for the University of Texas, the uh, uh, linebacker out of Pearland, Shadow Creek. Kind of got overshadowed, obviously. It happened on New Year's Day at 4.30 yesterday afternoon, but he becomes commitment number four for the University of Texas. Uh, Bobby, before we get out of here, I'm going to let you answer this question from Miguel. He says, is oh. coffee and football sticking around for the offseason? Oh, we're here. I mean, I, I love talking to Texas fans. I also think there's a – I mean – the first junior days, uh, the 20th of this year, uh, there is portal recruiting going on right now. They're still uh, trying to make sure they fill this uh, assistant coach's role. There's just a lot of stuff to talk about. Uh, there's other sports as well that we can uh, delve into, but uh, uh, a lot of moves uh, that we'll be talking about. Hopefully you'll join us. Uh, we've had a great time this year. It's been uh, eye-opening, and I just love to be part of the Longhorn community and help bring it together, uh, frankly. That's been one of the big things for me that, that has made me smile as a former student, someone who graduated from Texas, just seeing uh, the Longhorn community come together, maybe like never before. I don't, I don't want to say never before, but it's been so long since they've been together. That's that's refreshing to see that uh, re-spark. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be a part of that, really happy. And then before we get out of here, let folks know what they can expect later today right here on On Texas Football. Yeah, absolutely. I'm getting ready to talk to Brian Irwin. <laughs> Brian, Brian the, the former head coach of the Lamarck Cougars, state two-time state champion, uh, talking to him today for lunch with a coach. And then we've got the we've got the uh, live stream tonight with Rod Babers, uh, he and CJ, myself, uh, Aaron Hogan, hopefully was there. Blake, you may join us as well. Uh, we've got a crew because CJ and I have to travel today. Uh, try to get our way back to, to our hometowns and uh, whatnot. But uh, we've got a full a full uh, slate. Uh, we've got more stuff coming tomorrow morning as well. Uh, we've got a recruiting breakdown that CGA and I need to do because we're going to start previewing that big recruiting weekend, also talking a little bit more about Portal. There should be more Portal news in the next 24, 48 hours as well. There you go. All right. Well, we want to thank all of you for tuning in. Thank you for the super chats. We can't thank you guys enough for that. It's been a heck of a ride this season. But like Bobby said, we're not going anywhere. I want to thank Coach Shipley for joining us and Manscaped for being a sponsor of today's show. And for Bobby Burton and CJ Vogel, I'm Blake Monroe, and we'll see you tomorrow morning. Keep it up.